Father, you have this amazing way of working through ordinary people in ordinary situations to do extraordinary things. And Lord, as we dig into some people that led up to the time of Jesus' birth, help us to see that just as you work through them, you also work through us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a phrase that I grew all too familiar with as a child. Go to your room and think about what you've done, and don't play while you're in there. It was that last phrase that hurt the most. You see, I loved being in my room. I had set up, and I think it's still buried somewhere, a Nerf basketball hoop on the back of my closet door. And I'd play this game where I would always sink the winning three-point shot at the buzzer. But the moment that my mom or dad told me, no playing, I knew what that meant. I had to sit in my room quietly until my time of punishment for who knows what I had done was over. In our culture, we sometimes equate silence with punishment. We have a hard time being still, sitting quietly and just listening. Pastors have a hard time not gabbing all the time. Our society is fast moving. Our calendars are just crammed to the hilt. There is absolutely zero margin for any surprises. <clears throat> to sit still in one place, it's not the easiest thing to do. Part of the reason I think that we struggle with sitting still is maybe we're afraid of what we'll hear when we listen. Now, as we enter into this crazy time of year, it's my hope that we will make time to listen to the message of Christmas. Our God took on human flesh, and he showed up among us. He sacrificed his life for us so that we would be marked as his children and have forgiveness. A new life today, a new life for eternity awaits us all. But what is so amazing about this extraordinary story of God's grace is that he works through very ordinary people and it all plays out in quite ordinary ways. <coughs> have any of you ever been to Dublin, Ireland? Show of hands if you've been there. Well, we do have a few. Great. Dublin is a huge tourist spot. Tourists go, now these first two are related for the pubs and the beer, and they also go for the sightseeing, maybe a little less. But the most popular destination in Dublin, and this surprised me, was the zoo. They must have a special animal like a Loch Ness monster or something. But the second most famous place in Dublin, or I believe it's in suburban Dublin, is a college that has this book called the Book of Kells. This is a Bible that was completed around the year 800 AD, well before the printing press. Each page in the Bible looks somewhat like what you see here, intricate illustrations. Thousands of hours went into putting together this Bible. But you cannot just walk into the college, walk right up to that Bible and look at it. You first have to look at quite a few older books. The reason they do that is to whet your appetite for what's coming. Then you're prepared to truly enjoy this extraordinary Bible. And that's exactly what Luke is doing in his gospel. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1 for the next several weeks. And at the center of the gospel of Luke is the story of Jesus, obviously. But that's not where he starts. He doesn't begin with Jesus. He begins with an ordinary couple named Elizabeth and Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest. Elizabeth was from the family line of Aaron. What that meant was, if you were from Aaron's family line, you were either a priest or married to a priest. 
And these two were a very faithful couple. They loved the Lord dearly. Now, Zechariah was not some kind of a super priest. He did not have the most sermon downloads on iTunes. He did not have the largest church in Galilee. He was not being followed by crazy on Twitter. He was a normal, ordinary priest, simply doing his job and being faithful. Both of them were called upright in the sight of God. They observed the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. Now, that doesn't sound ordinary, does it? I know that I'm not blameless. I don't follow all of God's commands perfectly. I need forgiveness. But that's not what Luke is saying about this couple. He's not saying they're perfect. Rather, they are faithful. And this was important in that day and age, and I'll explain why, because they had no children. In, in ancient culture, back in those days, if you were married, old, and had no kids, people would kind of look at you and go, what's wrong with you? Terrible thing. They would ask, why has God removed his favor from you? You must have done something that caused God to remove his hand from you of love. Now, they did not respond by saying, why us? Their default was, we're going to remain faithful, even in the midst of things we don't understand, in the midst of things that are so challenging. There's a good lesson for there, uh, there for us as we face life and all the stuff it can throw at us. We may wonder, has God removed his hand of blessing from me? When others say, I see you go to church pretty regularly, but your life is more of a wreck than ours is. What a great thing to say. What's going on? The call is to remain faithful. And that's what we see from Zechariah in Luke 1, verses 8 and 9. His priestly division was on duty. Here's how that worked. If you were a high priest, you would live in the city of Jerusalem, and you spent all of your time at the temple itself. If you were not a high priest, you were then put in a subdivision with other priests, and they would live outside Jerusalem, scattered around the country. Every once in a while, your division would be called upon to come into Jerusalem to the temple and to serve. You would make sacrifices, you'd burn incense, among other things. It was a rotation. Well, it's his turn, so his division shows up at the temple. Lots are cast, and the lot fell to Zechariah. That means he gets to go into the inner sanctuary, the holy place. This is a very big deal. Think Old Testament for a moment. The temple literally means the place where God dwells. The closer you get to the inner room, the holy place, the closer you get to the presence of God. Just imagine this opportunity for an ordinary Zechariah. You get to go into the inner sanctuary, into God's presence, and burn incense. I mean, this is a high point in his life. So he makes his way in there. Outside, everyone else is praying, waiting for Zechariah to come back out. And it takes longer than expected. But when he got in there, the angel Gabriel was waiting. Gabriel said, I have some good news, Zechariah. Your prayers have now been answered. You're going to have a son. His name will be John. Now, we know him better as John the Baptist. But he's not going to be an ordinary son. Your son is going to prepare the way for the Messiah, the promised Savior. Your son will call many people back to the Lord. He'll be a powerful worker for God. He's going to do something amazing as God works through him and through you. So how did Zechariah respond? Well, like we probably would too with an ordinary faith. Remember the story of a man from the Old Testament named Abraham? 
God comes to him and says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands on the seashore. Abraham and Sarah and his wife were really excited about that. Then a month goes by, a year, five years, ten years, thirty years, fifty years. No kids. They're wondering, God, what are you doing? And then God shows up again. But this time, Abraham is a mere 100. And Sarah's a spring chicken of 90. And Sarah overhears that she's going to become pregnant. And she laughs. <laughs> At my age? Sure, God. You know, we heard about this decades ago. Now, you and I struggle to wait in line 30 seconds at Wendy's for a cheeseburger. <laughs> but they have to wait well over 50 years before they can have the promised offspring. Really, Lord? And Zechariah responded in the same way. How's this going to happen? My wife is old. And then he asked the question, would you give me a sign? Be careful what you ask for. The angel Gabriel said, okay, here's your sign. For nine months, go to your room, sit, don't play, and listen. Could you imagine having to be in your room for nine months? Which raises a question. What if we would take even one minute a day sat in silence and listened for God? What if we sat for five minutes and reflected on His Word? You see, it's through His Word the Holy Spirit works to reveal God and His promises to us. If we openly admit it, we're a lot like Zechariah in our faith. The Bible is filled with promises that we can, see, that we can struggle to believe. Do you ever worry about money? What did Jesus say? Do not worry about what's your life, what you will eat or drink, or about what you will wear. The pagans run after those things. But seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. well I guess we don't need to worry about that one too much. How many of us get filled up with anxiety? Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything. This one smacks me hard. But in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request with thanksgiving to God. How often are we afraid? The most commonly used expression, phrase in the Bible is, do not be afraid or fear not. In times of fear, we have the blessing of being able to sit still and listen to God's promises. Now, at the end of nine months of waiting, I guarantee you, Zechariah had a new respect for and a feeling about God's promises. When God says something, it's going to be true. And as he made his way out of the temple that day, the people were gathered there, were praying for Zechariah. He was going to step out and share the ironic blessing that we use at the end of every service. The Lord bless you and keep you. But when he steps out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. He tried to explain what happened to them through hand signs. Was this the first game of charades we saw in the Bible? You see, through hand signs, he struggles to share that his wife Elizabeth is pregnant. The forerunner of the Savior is on the way. And then you get this word from Elizabeth in verse 25. The Lord has done this for me. He has looked on me with favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people. I think there's some lessons we can learn from Zechariah. The first is staying faithful, even when it is brutally hard. A second lesson 
is that God works through ordinary people just like us to do extraordinary things in his kingdom. Please do not sell yourself short and say, there is no way God could work through me. That's not his voice. That's Satan's voice. The third thing, and I think the most challenging for us, that we can learn from Zechariah is the importance of listening. So let's all take some time out this crazy time of the year and listen to what God has to say. The message is that of the gift of an infant Jesus. He lived a perfect life for us. He went to the cross that had your name and my name written on it. He died there to take your place. He rose to bring you forgiveness and life in His name. You are a dearly loved child of God. That's a message for ordinary people who have been given an extraordinary gift of a Savior in the infant Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus. Amen.